It is Wyman and Bob on 710 ESPN Seattle. We've been looking forward to this conversation for a while. We had such an awesome time talking to this guy on the field before a game uh, this past season. One of our favorite interviews of the year, Dave. We've talked about wow, it afterwards yeah. and, and really just sort of reflected on what a fantastic year it was for the Seattle Mariners and this player in particular, who is now joining us on the Emerald Queen Casino Sportsbook Hotline. The one, the only Mitch Hanniger is here. Mitch, how are you, man? Doing great. Thanks for the kind words. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, and our listeners are in for a treat because you've agreed to talk nothing but MMA with me for the next 20 minutes, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. Whatever you want. <laughs> we, we still need to do that, by the way. You and I just sit down and have a conversation about uh, MMA, but we will do that another time. Definitely. Uh, and we'll, we'll get into what, what the, um, what's going on with you. The 87th Annual Sports Star of the Year Awards presented by the Seattle Sports Commission are happening May 26th. You're up for uh, – uh, you're one of seven nominees for the Men's Sports Star of the Year. We'll get into that in just a moment. But, you know, we were just talking during the break and, and sort of reflecting over the article you wrote for the Players' Tribune, which was titled Dear Mariners Fans, which it was awesome. And I, I'm, I'm just curious, A, what, what were you prompted to do that? Was that something you wanted to do? Because you're, you're kind of a private guy. We don't hear a ton from you. You don't do a lot of media. You don't, you, there's not a lot of you out there in the public to consume. So was this something you, you had to sort of be coerced into doing, or is it something you wanted to do? Uh, I definitely wasn't coerced into doing it. Um, the players to, to Brune had reached out and asked if I wanted to do a piece. And as soon as um, they reached out and asked me, I jumped at the opportunity because I was really excited to kind of be able to craft whatever I wanted to say. And, and a lot of times, um, you know, when they ask certain news outlets ask to do an interview with you, um, things get kind of cherry picked or there's certain questions they ask and they plan on using and other ones they don't. And with that one, I, I kind of get to say whatever I wanted to say. And that's what was so exciting to me because I could really try to get across everything I want, wanted to say. And um, hopefully everyone liked the article and, um, I think it was really important to look back on the season and, and, um, you know, thank the fans and, and, and thank, thank them for all the support over the years. And with, with also looking back and saying like we fell short and that this isn't a success that last year's season was a good step forward, but it wasn't in my mind, it wasn't a successful season because we didn't make a playoffs and we didn't win the world series. And that's our main goal. Yeah. I thought that really came through Mitch. It was, uh, it was really well done. And you know, the, I think Mariner fans really appreciated that because you know you you were you were thanking them for for their turnout and everything but but also letting everybody know that the there's a lot more in store for this team and you know you, you've got to be really excited in this uh, off season going in after after a season like like you said you didn't didn't do what you set out to do but feels like you're on the verge of it this team I agree yeah um and you know Robbie Ray signing and Adam Fraser trade were, were definitely two um, impact moves that we made that are um, setting ourselves up to, to for it to be a good off season. And um, you know, I think there, I think we still need some, some more big upgrades and I know um, you know, adding a couple more players should put us over the top. And, and I think this game is, is really difficult. It's really difficult to win a world series. And I think uh, when you have that timing and that window of, of young prospects that are, should be ready soon, but also guys that, we need guys that come in that can produce this year. And um, although we have great prospects that I'm looking forward to, you know, put on the Mariners uniform, they still are unproven. And I think the more guys that we can get with a steady track record of playing against the best and the best in the world um, at the MLB level, the better. And, and then we supplement those, those prospects in with those guys. And I feel like that's our best chance of success. You know, Mitch, one one of the things you wrote about in that Players Tribune story, which I would recommend all of our listeners check out and read, it's it's really really well done. Uh, but there there was the one thing of all that you talk about your injuries, you talk about your struggles, things like that. But the thing that jumped out to me that I wasn't aware of is that when you were in Double A, you weren't getting the reps, you weren't getting the time out there on the field the way you wanted to, and you made the request to be sent down, which seems so counterintuitive. And I think you even said, hey, some would look at this as career suicide. But just so you could get reps, so you could get the at-bats. Do you know any other players that have done anything like that? And was there ever a moment where you thought, what did I just do? Um, I don't know any other guys off the top of my head. But for me, I just, I've always um, 
worked really hard and have a lot of belief in my work ethic and I get a lot of confidence from there. And I know that if um, I knew I wasn't going to reach the big leagues by sitting on the bench in double A. So for me, it was the only option was to go down and prove to myself and prove to everybody else that I was a good player and that I was um, an MLB type player. And I knew if I had the opportunity, I would be able to show that. And so for me, it was like, this is my way out. This is my way basically up the ladder. I got to go back a step, but it should propel me forward faster. And I'm really lucky and thankful for um, the Diamondbacks and, and Mike Bell in particular, who recently passed away this year. Um, for He was our player development, um, head player development, and he agreed to send me down. And, and I ended up getting my reps and, and proving to myself and to the team that I was you know, better than I think they initially thought. And then it all worked out um, pretty well. Mitch, I remember meeting you when you first came in town in 2016. I think I came up to you because my son also went to San Luis Obispo. And, you know, I just remember looking at you. And now I'm reflecting on that because, you know, where you are right now as far as your career is probably, you know, I mean, you're probably wanting to strive for more always. But, you know, you've made it. But it was quite a path. (laughs) <laughs> you know, when you reflect Definitely. on how you got there and, you know, it's just uh, it's just interesting how and I don't know if you would answer this this way. I kind of went through a similar adversity as an athlete, but uh, I wouldn't trade it because I felt like it uh, I felt like it made me better. And, you know, it didn't go exactly Absolutely. the way you wanted with the injuries and things like that. But uh, are you to the point where you can you can look back on the injuries and all that training and all those lonely workouts that you had for for a year or two that uh, that that really helped you? Oh, absolutely. I feel like mentally I'm stronger than ever, and I know I can get through anything, and I'm prepared for anything. And um, yeah, absolutely. I'm I'm super grateful for everything that's happened and all the sleepless nights and the the struggles um, made me who I am today. And I feel like. It's also made me a lot more compassionate for guys that are going through injuries and um, kind of offering my, my advice and whether it's um, help mentally or, or even physically with, with some things guys going through injuries should be focusing on. And um, hopefully at the end of the day, I, I can just help more teammates and help more guys I play with that, that might be struggling after a big injury or a big surgery. Um, and I think it's just another tool in my toolbox where I can be a better teammate. Hey, Mitch Hanniger is our guest here with Wyman and Bob on 710 ESPN Seattle. What what was the end of the season like for you? I mean, that was unlike as a fan, as somebody who's been in the city for a long time, a long time, long-suffering Mariner fan, the electricity around this team and the run you guys win on and, and the, the prospects of, of man, they, they, they might actually make it to the postseason. I mean, to win 90 games and have it end the way that it did, and I know it didn't end the right way, but just – a packed stadium where it was just so loud, so electric. We hadn't seen that here in years. What was that like for you being out on the field in the middle of that? Uh, kind of hard to, to put in words, to be honest with you, still even now when I look back on it. But, um, man, the excitement that we had in the locker room, just coming to the field every day in September, you know, I've never experienced that before. I've never experienced um, a season going down to the wire and playing for something way bigger than yourself. And a lot of, you know, in the past couple of years with the Mariners, we've kind of been knocked out a little bit earlier, <laughs> a little bit earlier than you know, the last day of the season. So, um, you know, guys start looking at their, their phones and the calendars and seeing when they can go back home and what they're going to do in the off season. But it wasn't any of that. And um, like I said earlier, the goal is to win a world series and everybody was pulling in the same in direction for that. And it was incredible. The, the buzz around the city, the, the fans every night. I hope that that's what every, game at T-Mobile Park is like from here on out and I hope that we're providing that type of atmosphere all the way through September and even October and all the way to and through the World Series. Did you get a feeling from the 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 crowd that they they just expected you to come up with something big because you kind of went on a tear and the, the second to the last game of the season you go four for five you drove in five runs hit the home run I mean just an electric night for you individually but it just seemed like when you stepped up to the plate, I, as a fan, just felt like, all right, yeah, he's going to do something here. Like, if you didn't do it, it felt kind of weird. Did you kind of get that sense that it, it, it's flowing and they expect me to get this done right yeah. now? Yeah, and um, like I said, I mean, going through a lot, and I, I've been dreaming and um, looking forward to those situations for a long time, and I feel like I've done a lot of visualization and, and mental prep for those, and um 
it's kind of funny how everything kind of seemed to unfold the way I wanted it to. And although, you know, ultimately didn't make the playoffs. And I, I just remember on Friday night, that last series we had um, the Angels in town, Friday night we lost. And I feel like driving home that night and getting home, I was just, I was pretty devastated. I was like, man, we have such a great opportunity here and we just blew it. Um, we knew we kind of needed to sweep them. And we were hoping that at that night I was hoping, I was like, okay, if we win tomorrow, Saturday, if, which is Saturday and, and Sunday, there's still a really good shot we get in. And um, had that really awesome game Saturday and everybody was, was erupting and we were having a blast. And then Sunday just kind of fell apart on us and ended up, you know, the teams we needed to lose didn't lose. And um, and that kind of was just even more emotional with, with Seager send off. And, um, yeah, I mean, a lot of a lot of great things to look back on and um, a lot of areas that we can look back on and look to just kind of kind of sure up and improve so that we can be in the playoffs next year and, and make it all the way to the World Series and win it. Well, Mitch, you mentioned uh, Seager, who is certainly a leader, but we also heard from some of your teammates that you, you're the rock in there. But as far as the, like the core of leadership on this team, and I know it changes every year, year to year, but who are some of the guys that, uh, that you're – and are you talking to those guys in the off season and talking about last season and what's going to happen next season? Tell us a little bit about uh, the leaders on this team. Yeah, I think um... – as far as the position side goes, I think uh, myself and, and JP and, and Tom Murphy and um, Ty France, those are the guys that have kind of emerged and are going to be looking to lead the group next year. And um, and as far as the pitching staff goes, uh, I know Marco's always been on the forefront and been a great leader for the pitchers. And I'm sure Paul and, and, and Stack and Diego, um, amongst other guys will kind of fill that role as well and, and take the younger guys under the, under the ropes and, and show them what it means to be a professional and how we go about our business and how we prepare to win. Um, those things are very important, very valuable on a team. And I think, especially I, with adding Robbie Ray, that's another guy who's been around the game for a while now and has had a ton of success. And um, he's going to be a great voice for the pitchers and for the rest of our team in our clubhouse. And I'm, I'm thrilled that he's, he's joining our staff and our team. Hey, Mitch, as far as your, your individual play goes, and I know you always focus on the team, but now that we're in the off season, you have a chance to look back at your season. Only second time in your career you played 157 games, and we in that article you wrote, you, you chronicle your injuries, and you've had a lot of bad luck there. But just physically, how did you feel throughout the season, um, and, and how much different – was your 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 preparation in the off season in order to play that much because you had a i mean 39 home runs career high 100 runs driven in career high a tremendous year for you and playing that number of games i've got to believe incredibly satisfying what did you change drastically in the off season what what led to the season you just had um as far as this past this off season currently there's not a whole lot i've i've changed i've just tried to fine tune some things but going into last year, the off season before, uh, having missed a year and a half leading up to it, um, I'd taken all the stuff that I'd done previous to my surgeries and then added in a bunch of new stuff that focused on a lot more core, a lot more body awareness. Um, and I've talked about this a few different times, so sorry if I'm beating a dead horse here. With, with <laughs> I've done a lot of different hanging, uh, swinging, climbing, so, stuff that guys don't really, I guess, think about doing. And um, sort of working with a new trainer that – has helped me a ton with my body and, and trying to focus on smaller areas of where I'm, where I was missing some strength. And, um, you know, I still do my bulk heavy, heavy lifts that focus on the, the brute strength, but really fine tuning my body. And, and so I could last, you know, my goal every year is, you know, to play as closest to 162 games as I can. And, um, I felt like I added strength in areas that I had, um, missed out on in years past. And I think, I think the um, the power surge, you know, showed that, and um, I'm looking forward to building off it and, and coming back for even better 22. Yeah, Mitch, the workouts, you know, we saw something on Twitter. It was really interesting to, to watch, you know, just the, the, the hanging stuff and all the different movements and everything that, that you did. How did you – how did you come about that? And then, you know, there's a whole bunch of different ways to, to get it done. But what was it about that, uh, that particular path uh, that, uh, that appealed to you as far as uh, rehabbing your injuries? Um, 
just I guess the year before kind of trying it I think throughout the injuries I've I've kind of tried everything and I've discarded discarded what I haven't found useful and um kept what I have found useful and you know I, I met my trainer Austin um right before I had all my surgeries and I really liked his philosophy on on strength training and just being a, a human first is one of his first thing he says you know like you want to move a lot move correctly and then we'll focus on being a better athlete after that um and i've taken on that approach and and look to build upon it this off season it's been very helpful and i mean for me i just my body felt better and better as i was coming off of a whole bunch of surgeries and so i knew this was the the right way i needed to train for myself and um for everybody it's not the same but i think the biggest the biggest thing as an athlete is you have to figure out you have to master your own body and for me every year i feel like i get better and better at knowing myself um so I know I'm continuing to get better uh, athletically, and and that's been a huge part. Hey, as far as the mental training goes, how, how big is that for you? Because I, I'm 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 looking back. I think you and I debated on Twitter a bit over it was actually a UFC fight, and and I don't think you loved how the corner man was working with his fighter at the time, and I can't remember who it was, but it was kind of right. it was kind of negative, and you were you were basically saying I'm paraphrasing, but hey man that. That that's you know that's kind of counterproductive. You don't want to hear what you're doing wrong. Tell me what I'm doing right or something. And I was saying, well, you yeah. know, it's it's his job to sort of correct them. Like, hey, you keep dropping your hand. You got to get that hat, whatever. So it, it just led me into the mental part of how you approach the sport. How 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 much of that do you focus on? A lot. I do. I do a lot of reading. Um, I'm a big fan of meditation. Big fan of visualization, affirmations, and um, you know working on my subconscious mind. That's something that Edgar has, has taught me a lot and, and pushed me down that rabbit hole. That's been a big help for me. Um, but yeah, as, as far, I think the language in which we speak in is really powerful. And I think that um, we, have, we have to be a little more careful with our words when we're talking about ourselves because your subconscious doesn't, doesn't know the difference between sarcasm and, and um, especially in that particular fight, I felt like and it's very, I'm not saying it's easy, and, uh, but I think that coaches need to be very cautious with how they talk to their players or fighters. And in the heat of the fire, in the middle of a fight, sometimes you need, need to do something to fire the guy up. So, um, and, I, and I think in that particular fight, the guy wasn't winning, and he ended up winning. So I look back and I go, hey, the coach did a good job because he ended up winning the fight. But there's, <laughs> there's certain things I, I like to focus on, the positives, and I like to um, make positive changes when you're talking about the body and not focusing on the negative movements I, I, to reframe it positively. Um, instead of saying, you know, don't pull your head out. It's keep your head on the ball all the way through contact. That's a positive thought. And um, I think those, those little um, adjustments can be very helpful and they're undervalued. It sounds like I'm screwed because I got lots of sarcasm going on in my brain. You said that's, not, <laughs> it's not a, that's not a good thing. Hey, Mitch, well, I, tell- I think I think you know. There's and that look. There's a as, as an athlete, like there's there's always a little bit of doubt, and um, our mind tries to plays tricks on us, and our mind tries to you know do certain things in order to keep us safe. And I feel like the more aware of the tendencies of where your mind will go, and just observing it, and not. Um, listening to your mind as if it's everything is fact you know if i if my thoughts were um spilled it spilled out of my mouth every thought that people would think i'm crazy but there's you know there i there's certain things i i discard and there's certain things i pay attention to and then i also i'm trying to be conscious and push my mind down the rabbit hole i want it to go down as opposed to getting off whack yeah well that's really interesting i think it's really important for baseball players too because it's just such a your sport it's just such a long grind you know and then we talk about uh, the mental side of it but also you know the the support i'm talking about you being described as the rock and your rock is uh, is amanda your wife but uh also you talked a little bit about your family tell us about you, you mentioned the trainers as well that you that you have but uh tell us about your support group and what that meant to you when you were going through all of this uh, adversity yeah my my wife was really big for me and she's always been there for me so um i owe a lot of i mean mean, if not all a lot of my success to her and and um having you know missing a a year where during covid times my wife was pregnant um there were some positives for me that came out of it i got to spend way more time with her and make sure we were being safe and and um to bring my daughter in the world and my daughter just turned one 
about a month and a half ago. Uh, and it's, the off season has been great to spend more time with them because in season, I uh, didn't get a whole lot of time with her with the travel and just with, with how long we were at the field every single day. And even, even on home games, it's, you know, you're only with your family for a couple hours every day. Um, so the off season is really great to soak that time in and, and to try to help out a little bit more than I can during the season. Cause she does pretty much everything uh, for our family. <laughs> so she's been, she's been amazing. Hey, Mitch, uh, last thing before we ask you about the uh, Sports Star of the Year awards, i got to ask you, just any any doubt in your mind that we're going to get a full season this year? Obviously, we're in the middle of a, of a lockout, which absolutely stinks for me as a baseball fan yeah. and all baseball fans, especially coming off the season you guys just had, all the momentum the league had. The timing is awful. Right. But uh, are you fearful that, hey, we're going we're gonna to get a, an abbreviated spring training or maybe not get 162 in? How are you feeling about that? I like to stay positive and, and uh, hope that everything's going to go smoothly. And I think um, for me, that's the, that's the only thing I'm focusing on. I'm focusing on showing up to spring, hopefully the same time I always do and um, getting ready and prepared to win a world series. Like I said, and um, it, I think it, there was a lot of, you know, buzz around our city and within the game. And it is, you know, pretty unfortunate that um the league and, and the owners imp- implemented the lockout. I felt like this was a little unnecessary and I felt like they didn't, this is a fact that they didn't need to do it. And we could have kept on um, having a normal off season as far as trades and signs go. And, and, and we could have had negotiations going on in the background and hopefully come to an agreement um, sooner than later, but that's not the route that was taken. And, and I hope that things get handled and um, for the fans sake, because we all want to play for you guys and, and um, have another year of great baseball. Yeah, couldn't agree with that more. It didn't need to happen. Uh, all right, as we said, the 87th Annual Sports Star of the Year Awards, which is presented by Seattle Sports Commission, is happening Thursday, May 26th. Um, it's such a great event that's held every year, and you are one of seven nominees for Men's Sports Star of the Year. The last Mariners player, by the way, to win, I believe, is Felix Hernandez in 2009. So... That's a that's a long gap, Mitch. It's up to you, man. Yeah, it's yeah. up to you. Yeah. It's it's got to be an, a huge honor, though, just to even be nominated. I would think, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I was super grateful for the nomination, and uh, fingers crossed that you know hopefully I can win it. And I think that would mean a lot to to me and my family, and also um, you know to the mayor's organization. Good luck, well, Mitch. Yeah, and people, I should let people know that you can vote. The voting runs until January 23rd. You can go to sportsstaroftheyear.org slash vote. Sportsstaroftheyear.org slash vote. Cast your vote there until January 23rd. The event happens May 26th. Mitch, it's always a pleasure to speak with you, man. Thanks so much for taking the time. We love talking to you, and I'm going to nail you down one day. We're gonna, You and I are going are gonna to sit down and talk MMA for a good 15, 20 minutes Let's one day. Let's do it. Let's do it. Yeah, we got some good fights coming up. Absolutely. We appreciate you, man. Thanks so much. Thank you guys for having me. I appreciate it. Hear Wyman and Bob every afternoon, 2 to 7 on 710 ESPN Seattle.